Welcome to the Beyond Barriers podcast. If you're an ambitious woman who wants to dominate your career, then you are in the right place. This podcast is co-hosted by Nikki Barua, digital innovator, serial entrepreneur, author, and speaker. And Monica Marquez, ex-Googler, diversity expert, and senior corporate leader. From inspiring stories to cutting-edge strategies, you'll learn how to develop the skill set, mindset, and tool set to get future ready fast and accelerate your success. Hi, I'm Nikki Barua, your host for today's episode. What if your biggest opportunity was also your biggest challenge? Would you go for it? How would you find the courage and confidence to take action? Today, we're speaking with Karina Edwards, an inspiring leader who embodies grace under fire. Karina shares her professional journey, how she discovered her purpose, and what drives her to make a positive difference in people's lives every day. Karina is the CEO of Quill, a digital health company that empowers users with step-by-step personalized directions on the health journey. Karina has served in executive positions at leading healthcare organizations and recognized by Becker's Healthcare as female health IT leaders to know. In this episode, Karina shares why it's so important to be guided by a true north and how to make sound decisions about your life and career. Karina provides guidance on navigating effectively through an unexpected crisis and what it really takes to lead with courage and conviction. Visit imbeyondbearers.com where you'll find show notes and links to all the resources in this episode, including the best way to get in touch with Karina. Hi, Karina. Welcome. Thank you for joining us on the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This is such an exciting opportunity. Well, this is a really special because I, I know we're in the midst of so many things going on right now. And for you as a leading a healthcare company, I'm really grateful for you taking the time and being willing to share your uh, guidance and wisdom with our listeners worldwide. Um, so let's just dive right in. Um, so first off, we'd love to learn more about you. Um, tell us the making of Karina and your story. I'm the CEO of Quill Health, the digital health joint venture between Comcast, NBC Universal, and Independence Lacrosse. But beyond my job, I'm clearly not my job. Uh, you know, I'm a golfer, a skier, a wife. I'm a former team athlete. Uh, I'm a huge foodie. I love live music, and I love um, my films and film festivals. And so I share all these passions with my husband. And, and you know, it, it's been an interesting uh, career journey for me because my personal mission is to make a positive impact in people's lives every day. And my journey to being a CEO and my journey to Quill has been grounded in those career choices that have allowed me to fulfill the mission. And so over the past uh, 23 years of creating new solutions for healthcare organizations, the focus is how do you deliver value, value to patients, value to the clinicians who care for those patients. And for me, it was never about being in technology. It was always saying, how can technology help, right? And so if you're thinking through the lens of an ICU nurse, how can technology help the nurse understand all the telemetry coming off a patient and make a better decision? How can technology help us give voices back to the patient from their doctor's notes and and their doctor's stories? And so it's just been a great grounding throughout my background at working at great brands like Philips and Nuance and Zinx Health and now here at Quill. It's just been so so wonderful to be able to fulfill my personal mission as well. That's amazing. I mean, you know, to have that alignment between what you personally care about and be able to contribute that professionally is uh, really what um, drives fulfillment. And uh, I think more people want that, but don't quite know how to get there. So I'm curious about exactly how your career evolved. You are, uh, you've held senior executive roles at a variety of great companies, and now you're the CEO of Quill. Um, how, how, tell us more about how your career exactly unfolded. Where did you begin? What specific things um, helped you take that next leap and, uh, you know, evolve into the next stage as a leader? Great question. The, 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 it all starts, I think, for me with the work has to be, um, has to fuel my curiosity and it also has to fulfill me in the mission. And so I've always been a very mission-driven person, and I lucked out in my first career step after college. I think we all can look back at our careers, and as much as we had planned to be all of these things in our university self, 
when that first job came around, that's when we really got to define our first version of our career self. And so for me, uh, I was going to school in the D.C. area. Um, I uh, got the job opportunity to become an implementation uh, engineer and a project manager for a healthcare technology that was being rolled out to the Department of Defense hospitals around the globe. And the contract I was assigned to was a Navy hospital. And so if you think about this from a 21-year-old's perspective, you get a pass to go around the globe and introduce nurses and doctors to a new technology system that was going live. And I got to see firsthand of how disparate the information to the doctor and clinician was and how hard it was for them to aggregate and see everything and make the best decision possible. And this was way back before we all had our medical portals and our electronic health mm -hmm. records, right? This was um, back before those times we take for granted today. And that really set me on a course. And so being able to really deliver a system, uh, I'll date myself, it was on the Palm Pilot 1000 uh, oh. that gave mobile rounding right. to actual clinicians. It was so fulfilling. And so that started me on the career path of healthcare and really where technology and healthcare could add value. And my role there moved from quickly, you know, I was curious as to how we could do this better, faster, quicker. And so I went from an individual contributor and a year into my career, I was managing teams of 20 plus people that were deploying the solution to the Army, the Navy and others. So I got up into management quickly to lead people with the best plan of action and the best way to, um, to drive that forward. And, uh, you know, it was interesting because I was at a, at a consulting company then. And so um, my, last, my last point on the journey, it was, you know, pivoting to knowing when to pivot. And so I lived in the consulting world for a while, but then I always felt like, you know, consulting is all about creating a product with people. Wouldn't it be so much better and easier to create a product product? And so I pivoted and moved over to uh, Philips, and that's when I was really in my first clinical information system that was FDA um, uh, cert, uh, approved. And so when you go into that change, I can tell you it wasn't easier. Uh, it was just as hard, and it, it just really ground you in the fact that if you don't deliver value and you don't deliver results, you can't drive top-line growth. And so that's kind of fueled me throughout my career. Uh, so you've made a, a lot of interesting um, you know, shifts in terms of changing lanes from, uh, you know, being an individual contributor to very quickly getting into management, going from consulting to corporate roles, um, and then also uh, going from services to products. Um, what has helped you excel? Because usually there's tends to be a level of fear and insecurity about switching lanes. You know, this is what you know, and if I go into something different, what if I'm not as successful? Um, what if, um, you know, I'm not set up for that? What has helped you not only switch lanes, but excel in those and level up uh, so effectively? It's been about focusing on what's the worst case scenario. And when you really break that down, the worst case scenario is you don't like it and you try something else. Um, and so, you know, I was um, in a different financial situation uh, than, than, than most people. You know, I was... Uh, I didn't have independent wealth. I was broke as a college student, as everybody else is. But after my first job, I had a lot of savings. And so, you know, when I, when I looked at those savings and I looked at the risk reward for transitioning, it wasn't that big of an economic impact if something was to go wrong. It was also a great job market. Uh, and so I think it was really grounding myself in what is the worst case? What's the best case? What do I want to do? What drives me? What sounds interesting? And I think, you know, being in consulting, starting, you, you and I have share our background here, you know, going from engagement to engagement, you have to shift and change mm -hmm. all the right. time. And so I just brought that to the rest of my career. Every two years, every three years, hmm, that was fun. That was awesome. What can I do next? What's the next exciting thing? And so I think that's been a path of always finishing what you start and delivering results that will cascade you into being curious about the next thing that can truly deliver value and also enhance your career. That, that's a really uh, refreshing way of looking at it. I hadn't thought of it that way as even in a corporate uh, career track, different from consulting, that you could think of it almost like the consulting engagements and look at what next do you want 
to learn or deliver value in and uh, how you think of it in terms of different building blocks to your career. That's fascinating. Um, what are some of the um, common career uh, traits that you've seen in successful leaders and your own belief system about leadership? Um, and specifically, I'd be curious to hear your perspective on going from an individual contributor to taking on management and leadership roles. And the reason I ask that is it's one of the most common things we hear about is people that are great as individual contributors, and then they get to a certain point in the career where they feel compelled to take on leadership roles because they feel like, okay, I've been in this uh, industry for 10 years. You know, it's time for me to have people to manage or teams to manage, and they may or may not be suited for it, or they may not have uh, developed the competencies for it. What's your view of not only what it takes uh, to make the transition, because you've done that and done that very early in your career, but then also what are the successful leaders all demonstrate? It's really personal preference, and I think the more people get comfortable with that, it's not what should I do. It's gosh, what do I love doing? And so for me, coming from a team-based sports background, Mm -hmm. for me, I loved leading. I liked being the captain of the team. I loved collaborating with people. I loved being in a spot where I could be the most authentic version of me. And it was finding that confidence that I believe for me personally was grounded in some team sports and some early development. But for others that don't have that background, it's really for them to assess what brings you joy? There's mm-hmm. nothing more um, to me. It, it was never about look what my team did, right? It's to, to bolster me up. It was, wow, look what we've done. Mm-hmm. Look what, how we've accomplished this goal. And, and so I think with that perspective, I wasn't climbing the ladder individually. I was bringing people along and celebrating their success as they grew beyond me. At my last job um, at, at Improvada, when I was there, I was excited to see that I had peers and people that worked for me at Nuance that joined in Pravada in peer roles to me. And it was awesome. They, didn't, they weren't direct reports anymore, but they had earned that confidence and that spot on the team and they were killing it. And so it was so awesome to see other people excel. And that goes back to people have to ground themselves in what makes, what gives them joy. And it sounds so cavalier, but it, it, it really... You can't wake up every day excited about what you're focused on. And if you get put into a management role and you don't like leading people, you don't want to be that available, you don't want to be that authentic, um, and that's okay, own it. It's perfectly fine. There are so many amazing individual contributors that I uh, rely on every single day that deliver so much value to a business and get a lot of fulfillment in their role. So it's really a personal preference. Right. Instead of putting on the pressure and the expectation that you should be a certain level or have certain responsibilities because of the number of years or the tenure you've had. And I think it just puts people into uh, a box that, uh, frankly, isn't right for them. Um, so I think uh, the pursuit of joy is a really great way of looking at what would help you find the path that's right for you instead of running someone else's race. I I couldn't agree more. I think right now when you think about the big transition over the past five or six years to gig economy workers, not just the the day-to-day gig economy workers that we think about in the service industry, but also professionals who are doing different gigs and doing them really well. And they're individual contributors of their own company adding value to three, four, five companies. It's such an exciting path to see. They didn't need to go, you know, do that corporate position and climb that corporate ladder. They found their own way. What do you wish you had found out earlier in your career? Oh, that's a good one. I wasn't prepared for that question. So I think <laughs> the, the thing, my, my younger self, um, it's going to be okay. Breathe. You know, when you go through some of those big things, when you look back and when you had those moments of anxiety, you had those moments of self-doubt, they always work out. Mm. Um, and, and even if I had a career choice I made, I lasted three and a half months at a company and I pivoted quickly. It was the wrong culture. It was the wrong fit. And, you know, in the middle of that decision, I can tell you my anxiety level was very high. You're, oh, what's it going to look like on my resume? Am I going to look like a jumper? And I just had to be true to myself. 
And so you're, even this, this, this most recent career change is being very, uh, very vulnerable. You know, I, I did really ask myself, is this the right time to be a CEO? Am I ready? Um, and, and, and when I did that self-reflection, I said, let's go for it. And how did you actually process that? Because that's um, a very important um, decision that uh, a lot of people struggle with. Um, am I ready for this role? Am I ready for that big leap, whether it's stepping up into the next level of leadership or maybe it's quitting a job and uh, launching a first business? You know, those big transition points is where we tend to just pause and, and sometimes can get paralyzed and not know how to step out of inertia to actually move forward with confidence. So what helped you not only figure that out for yourself, but actually then have the confidence and the readiness to take on the role that you deserve? For me, it was the pros and cons. I always go back to this list. I, I love um, leadership books. Uh, you know, I, I actually I don't love uh, all of the digestion of leadership books, but the principles that come out of them, uh, and that whole notion of putting it down on a piece of paper, the positives and the negatives, and really trying to tune into your gut to mm -hmm. say, okay, you know, there, there's because there's different things. When I approached this job, it was uh, I was at an organization uh, where I had a lot of financial stability as well as great opportunities for wealth creation. Um, this this venture that I went to is more risky. That was a big pro and con. Um, you know, was I ready? Was I prepared? I believed I was, but now, you know, you got to prove it when you're in that role. And did I have the right energy? And was I ready to give the first year of my life to this venture and really dive in pro and con, right? And so I think when you, when you start laying them down for yourself, and you also talk to your friends and your colleagues and people that know you, it was phenomenal. I was uh, I was, you know, I was chasing the role and I had some self-doubt and I was clearly, I'm not going to do this. And I went to a friend's house who's such a great uh, friend and colleague and, and just, just a good close confidant. And I laid out all of my pros and cons for her. And she's like, okay, all I hear is fear, 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 fear. <laughs> so if you take away all the fear, it sounds like you really want the job. <laughs> oh. I hate you for that, but I love you for that. And it just gave me such a different perspective. And I was like, thank you for holding up the mirror. So sometimes you go through these points uh, and, and, and you have to own them. And when you see your way through them and you make the decision, I look back now and how could I have not done this, right? It's been such an amazing year. Wow, that, that's fantastic. That's a great friend, by the way. <laughs> oh, it's a great friend. Yeah. Well, and especially right now for what we're going through um, as a society, you know, because of the pandemic, I think um, the fear and the constant stress and anxiety can be um, beyond debilitating, where you can't see anything regardless of what might be right in front of you because there's this overwhelming sense of dread um, that a lot of people are struggling with. So I think bringing that perspective of being able to separate fact from fiction and, you know, have faith in something that is bigger than the fears we're feeling, um, I think that's so critical um, at this stage. Um, so sp more. speaking of the, uh, you know, of uh, your uh, company, Quill, tell us more about what Quill does and, uh, you know, what uh, the big mission is and uh, help, help our audience understand more about the company and the product and its mission. Sure. So uh, I just celebrated my one-year anniversary on March 18th, which is very exciting. Uh, and it's been such an amazing experience. The, the, the Quill team and I are creating solutions that help people and their caregivers organize and navigate their health life. And it's a digital health engagement platform that supports people to get through a health episode by personalizing an experience and inspiring them to become the healthiest version of themselves. So to give a great example, if you were going through a hip replacement uh, and you, you, you wanted to get back to the golf course and be very active, that's a very different health journey than somebody going through a hip replacement that wants to be able to walk a flight of stairs, mm -hmm. uh, carry a bag of groceries, or play with their grandkids. And so our, our engagement platform allows the providers to prescribe a care plan for that person, but then we tune it to the individual to make sure that they know 
how to navigate, how to best prepare, what's the clear liquid before surgery, what physical therapy do I do after surgery, uh, what, what home, home durable goods do I need to go in, who's going to pick me up, all those questions, they get to invite their spouse, their friends, their loved ones to go along with them on the journey, and all that information goes back to the, um, to the medical provider so they can see how you're doing in your pre and your post recovery. Oh, that sounds like a health concierge of sorts. That's uh, incredible to have all of your needs so beautifully designed as a customer experience. It's exciting. You know, we're, we're trying new uh, platforms. We're only 18 months old. We are live uh, with three customers. And now with this COVID-19 crisis, uh, we've gone into quick action and we've pivoted the, um, the, the product to be able to turn a COVID preparedness tool out that is being rolled out to our owners and also being rolled out to our customers. So we're able to quickly, I love the platform and the flexibility that it gives us to be able to address the concerns of employers at this point in time, uh, for patients at this point in time. So it's been great to be able to do this uh, with the backing of two amazing partners. That's incredible. It, everyone's had to pivot and adapt very, very quickly as a result of COVID-19. So um, Give us a perspective on uh, preparedness and, and just your um, perspective on the pandemic in general as a leader in the healthcare space. So I think, you know, if I take it back to everything you think about in leading through crisis, be it any crisis, uh, you have to first ground yourself in being the most authentic version of yourself. And it, it really starts with acknowledging reality and being transparent as you can possibly be. And communication right now is key across all levels of the organization, you know, across all the channels that we leverage to engage my team members. You know, for me, it's been virtual face-to-face -face meetings, which is the best approach. We have a company where that's possible. Um, you know, we've always been a mixed in-office, at-home culture, but for others, I'm sure you're pivoting and you're watching people not know how to use uh, video conferencing well, people not having always video on. Those nonverbal communication points are so important during this time. You need to make sure that your employees or your team or your spouse or your family, they're kind of with you through this. And then, you know, I think you use the rules. Uh, tell, them, uh, you know, tell them what you tell them, tell them what you told them, and tell them again, right? That communication best practice is even more critical today. Uh, I also think you need to have that superpower, which is to continuously evolve in how you deal with change. You know, crisis leadership is change management on steroids. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, you take in a lot of variables. You have to be able to pivot quickly when new information comes available. And so, you know, for us and for me personally, it was, okay, wait a second. Don't, can't we do this? Why can't we do this? Let's go do this. And it was a quick pivot. We didn't leave our customers behind. We made sure that we were grounded and focused on delivering everything we had in flight for customers, but then said, you know, how can we use this for good at a time uh, that the, the, the country and our employers and others need help? And so uh, that's how we will do this. But we also are not losing sight of the fact that this is accelerating our value. Uh, the more we can add value, the more we can add value in the post-crisis world. And so staying true to your mission, your strategy, your vision as you pivot is really important because don't let the crisis pivot you from your true north. Because at the end of the day, we have to all survive this as a business and the new innovations need to be grounded in delivering that value. That's excellent advice, especially about not losing sight of your true north. Um, in the last couple of weeks, I've had numerous conversations with uh, a lot of business leaders and entrepreneurs, and one of the um, common things I've observed is a, a bit of a um, you know, knee-jerk reaction of saying, oh my gosh, it's the end of the world and uh, here's what's going to happen. And maybe it's a knee-jerk reaction in taking too extreme of a uh, negative step uh, or a, a pessimistic assumption, or it's uh, being a little too opportunistic and completely deviating from strategy or plan. So I think your point about know your true north, you know, stay true to your mission and do what you need to do but adapt along the way. Absolutely. 
What do you um, see when you look into the future? You know, what's your view of the post-pandemic world? I mean, this crisis, regardless of, uh, you know, whether we're looking at a, a month or several months, but post that, I mean, there, what do you think will um, change permanently and what do you hope stays the same? So I'm not a futurist, but I'll say from past crises, you know, people around the world have always risen up and found creative ways to do things differently. And I think from those experiences, we've seen new innovations be born. And so during this crisis, I'm staying grounded in the fact that we are very resilient. I'm looking for the good that comes out of this, not the fear, which can be really hard to do as people face some of these new realities. You know, for all business leaders listening in, you know, I think you really need to find time to disconnect, disconnect from the news a little bit, disconnect from the day to day and any pivots that you're in and, and take a step up and look at a strategic view of the market that you are in and the potential pivots that market's going to make and the changes that will come as we move into this post pandemic world. And so, you know, in the healthcare market, right, there's a lot changing right now. You see the stimulus bills happening. You see people having to divert patients and cancel things. There's so much going on. But if you don't get close to your customers and understand how they're going to be impacted, then you don't know how you're going to be able to help them. And so staying close to your customers is critical. And then reviewing your strategic plan, which unfortunately now is very outdated. As of 12 days ago or 15 days ago, you can just throw that piece of paper out the window a little bit and say, what assumptions did we make and what are we staying grounded to and what is our strategic mission and vision and value and does that resonate with my buyer based on the changes that they're going through today and are most likely to have in the future that makes total sense and what's top of mind for you as the ceo of quill uh, the ceo of quill we're doing the exact same exercise you know we pivoted quickly uh, to deliver a tool to the market but we stayed true to the strategy of we are a digital engagement platform that can help people go through journeys. And this is a time where people are going through a journey because for us, it wasn't just about symptom checking. It was about getting them the best resources that are not going to be ours, like CDC resources and others. But it was also about making sure the long tail was covered. How do you work at home successfully? How do you homeschool successfully? How do you think about um, your life in, and your self-care? What if you become a caregiver all of a sudden and you're caring for somebody? There's all of these other aspects of your health life that you have to experience. And so that was always our vision and mission. And so we're mm -hmm. able to deliver something that stays true to that. And then top of mind post this, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that we can, you know, pivot uh, back to the focus of helping provider, payer, and employers really help their, their membership, their users, their patients organize and navigate their health life. Yeah, and, you know, in every crisis, there's uh, always opportunity if you are able to uh, keep your you know head clear and uh, focus on what is possible regardless of the level of disruption that's going on um, what advice would you give to people um, during this time that they're so overwhelmed with the stress the anxiety the constant barrage of bad news of uh, just you know personal self-management uh, tips or things that are success habits for you personally that have helped you navigate through some, uh, you know, difficult times throughout your personal life and career? So these are unprecedented times. Um, you know, my advice is to stay well. It's to follow the best advice and stay home and shelter in place. You have to have a work-life balance so that you can focus on yourself and the ones you're caring for. Because together we can get through this and we will emerge stronger but, you know, women tend to be perfectionists at times, and we're balancing more than ever work and relationships and household management and child care and education. And this is a time to give yourself a break. Something is going to go wrong and it's going to be okay. And if you stay true to your true north and bring your authentic self to your personal and professional life, you know, you'll have that opportunity to come through this in a, in a better way, even though right now you might not be able to see it. That is sage advice because we're all kind of in that place of juggling so many balls at the same time and from the same room as well, you know, and yes. uh, 
um, it's our sense of personal space has changed dramatically in the last couple of weeks. So, um, you know, um, as you're personally navigating through not only uh, leading your company and uh, uh, your team, but also the personal shifts that have probably happened, what is, um, what is a daily habit that um, grounds you? Oh, great question. Uh, so first, uh, it's always connecting with my husband, uh, just staying grounded, saying, hi, good morning, how are you? <laughs> how are we? Uh, and then, you know, from there, it's, uh, you know, we've been doing a lot with our family and our outreach. So we are, um, we are removed from our family from a town perspective. Uh, and so we are working out of our house, which is states away from our families. And so what we are doing is we are doing virtual, uh, fun, uh, FaceTimes and happy hours and other things with our friends and family to keep us grounded uh, and stay close to those that we love and care about and just to have that uh, that conversation that's not work and home to really broaden that. And so we don't have kids. And so for us, we're really staying grounded in our family and friends. Yeah, I think everyone's trying to figure out their own version of, uh, you know, love and connection and happy hour with quarantinis, right? Um, Absolutely. Um, one thing I'm curious about is um, confidence in terms of one's gravitas and personal presence. Um, it's differently expressed when you are in person and you have the ability to interact with colleagues or clients in person versus what we're experiencing now suddenly, uh, which is over video perhaps or you know, um, Zoom calls and so forth. Um, what are some things that would be very effective to apply right away? Because for some people, they've had that experience and there's others that have never had to interact this way, but it is going to be the way of the future. What are some things that women especially can adopt in terms of uh, coming across with uh, the gravitas and confidence over uh, a remote collaboration experience? First and foremost, video always. Don't be worried about what you look like. Don't be worried about, uh, you know, do you have on the right outfit? If you had to run to a call, the most effective way to communicate is non-verbally. And so with all of that, it was great. You know, I'll give an example. We have uh, daily stand-ups because of the pace that we're moving at with my leadership team. And on the daily stand-up, someone saw that I had some background because they could see my eyes and they could see me processing. And so they paused and they said, wait, Karina, I see you have some concerns about that. Say more. And that nonverbal communication is absolutely doable on the video conference. Just be confident enough to turn on the camera. Nobody cares. They just want to see you. Um, the second piece is uh, be prepared in your remarks. Think about the effective pause. Silence is still golden. All the communication rules and gravitas rules still apply. Uh, but I will give you a funny, a funny story. Uh, we were going through this and, you know, we're thinking through some really big plans and I was uh, uh, presenting them to my board and, you know, we're going through the plan and I'm being very professional. I have my gravitas and everything's going wonderful. And at the end of the call, uh, my board member, one board member says, you know, Karina, I'm a little nervous about this. You know, how are you feeling all about, about all this? And I looked at him on the camera and I said, oh my God, I'm, I'm a mess. Like, I, I think we can do it. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those like great moments where you're like, yeah, my superpower is to lead through adversity, but inside, oh gosh, I got a whole bunch going on. So <laughs> I think just being transparent and yeah. just telling them that like, hey, we're in this together and I will tell you everything you need to know, but trust me, I got this. <laughs> that's great. That's a great story. And I think that's part of what we have to rely on that as much as now we're having to... Uh, connect more through technology that uh, we should not lose our humanity in the midst of that. So um, great points for everyone. Um, Karina, this has been so fantastic and uh, I really appreciate you being on the show and sharing your wisdom and insights. And, uh, you know, any last words of advice to our listeners and especially to women professionals worldwide, if there was one thing you could say to everyone that would help them get future ready and, um, you know, excel in their careers and truly feel fulfilled, what would that be? I'll repeat it. It's always staying true to your true north and bringing your authentic self 
to both your personal life and your professional life. And so spend the time needed to reflect on your personal mission and how you can make a reality that feeds that joy every day. Uh, this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for having me on the, on the call. Thank you so much. Good luck and thank you again. Thanks for listening. There are thousands of podcasts out there and we are so grateful that you've chosen to listen to ours. Visit IamBeyondBarriers.com where you'll find show notes and links to all the resources referenced in this episode. And be sure to take the quiz on the website. Your score will tell you where you are, what helps you gain momentum, and what holds you back. You'll also get a free guide with cutting-edge career strategies. We'd also love to hear from you. Share your comments and topic suggestions on IamBeyondBarriers.com and we'll be sure to address them in future episodes. If you enjoyed our show today, please subscribe and rate the podcast or just tell a friend about it. See you next episode. Thank you.